This week, Dan gets a new game show. Jess learns how to blow snow. Dan hike, hike, hikes, and we learn what it's like to be a good pet owner. All this and more on this week's episode of the CC Mouse Podcast. Oh, yeah. Welcome to this week's episode of the CC Mouse Podcast. We are good for your ears. I'm Dan, and you can find me at RFS Dan. And I'm Jess, and you can find me at Gone to the Snow Dogs and Snow Dogs Vlogs. How come you cannot keep a straight face when you try to announce who you are and where you're from every week? Is this what happens in pitch meetings? Like, you're always giggling? Maybe. <laughs> I, I don't know what it is, but I every time you do this at the beginning of the podcast, I'm... I'm laughing out loud inside every time. I don't know why. Because it's about then, to be fun times. And I, I turn into a radio it, announcer guy. Yes. It's because you go from like your normal talky voice, which you do your normal talking voice through most of the podcast. But like we're literally on like, a oh, OK, we're going to talk about this. We're going to talk about this. And then you're just like, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> it does go from it does go from zero to 100. I mean, this is how I sound anyway, but it sounds a little more like this. Yes. It's just, I don't know why. Every time, every time it gets me, every time. It's like, even when it happened at the at, during uh, your game show, I could not stop laughing. Like, I was sitting on the couch. I wish I, I should have just filmed myself when you messed up your own intro on your own game show. Oh, I know. Like, three times in a row. It was like when you when your battery's dead in your clutch car and you push it down the hill and you try to hit the clutch and put it in first and have it like auto jump start itself. It was yeah. like that. I started going and I stopped and I forgot where I was and I looked at the camera and I, and, and this doesn't happen to me anymore or probably you because it's been so many years of video making but for right. one second I left my body and I was on the other side of the camera turning around looking at you and going like, dang Dan, this is you. Like you are this person <laughs> that is doing this right now in this second and you're the one that's going to provide all this entertainment. Like, and I'll rush to me and I drew a blank and I'm like, oh my gosh, like I got in my head for a second. And then it, yeah. it, it sorted itself out. Does the uh, does the podcast audience even know that you have a game show? You know what? No. And I was saving it because I was saving them from heartache. And poor Di is, <laughs> a, a, poor Di is a good good barometer on this. Is every time I want to start a project or do something, it lasts two or three episodes. It doesn't go on very long. And then poor Di will be like, oh my gosh, I have to watch another podcast or I have to listen to another thing or I try to start a Big Brother <laughs> podcast that didn't take off. So I wasn't really even sure that this game show thing was going to be more worth mentioning. But holy cow, it's done great for the last three weeks that I've done it. Yeah. Where can, where can we find your, your game show, Dan? You can find it at RFS Dan. And the game show is called Dantix. The only... Oh, I forgot it again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the only game show that has a host with a hawk. <laughs> and it's been great. You call it on Skype. You answer questions. It's fun. There's a it's leaderboard. So it's so fun. It's been, what, this is fourth week? Uh, we've done three in a row. We've done three in a row that were of three, any kind of production value. I was going to say, yeah, three production weeks, but technically it is fourth because you, you did have kind of a test run, a beta. You had a beta. <laughs> Which was great. That's some ground zero yeah. stuff when I, um, with no background, no nothing. We set it up on the live stream from zero and we got the cameras all set up. And then uh, I came with the thunder the next week. That was such a good, like the production value went up high. Yeah. Yeah. Every week you've, you've tweaked things just a little bit and made things a little bit better. And yeah. it's been super fun. I mean, I've, I've been at most of them. I moderate the chat. So I, I get to see you, you know, everybody that's there and watch everything that's happening. And it's, it's so fun like it's you I've known you a long time and you have talked about wanting to do this for as long as I've known you Forever. and I'm so happy that you finally just did it yes and that's without what that without all the overthinking without all that I have to have this I have to have that and that you know I tell people that all the time especially you I tell uh, yes, everybody this all you the do time tell me this. you you don't have to have the best of the best to do something it doesn't have to be perfect. Stop striving for perfection. Just put it out there and work with it as you go. You're never going to have a winner the very first time. Right. Never. It's not right. going to happen. And you're going to put it out there and you're going to learn things and then you're going to change those things. And as long as you can as long as you can be open to criticism what other people say and being able to look at those things and say, "Okay, I liked this. I didn't like this. Let's change it." You change it as you go, you modify as you go, and eventually it turns into something amazing. And I want to elaborate more on that. You're right with things like the podcast. We didn't know how to podcast, yes. and we just went for it. And now look how great it sounds. 
Yeah, it sounds a lot better than those first episodes. Right, only because we went through the struggle. And that's what I do like about the game show. I don't mind struggling through something I don't know to get to where it's at. My first time I ever wanted to start a game show was in 2007 or 8. I wanted, I always wanted to do an, a live interactive game show, but the technology wasn't there. Some of my friends had a website called the stream.tv and I would go down to their little mini studios and watch them do live interaction, te interactive television. And their biggest hurdles, they had a $10,000 TriCaster to be able to switch between regular like high eight cameras. And right. now you can do that with a free piece of software. Yeah. So it's come into itself and i mean uh, so i set up the show real quick guys with about six dollars worth of green screen well, well green um poster, poster board, board from walmart straight up walmart green poster board i have a webcam i have some lights from target that were just in the house like i didn't buy anything obs is free the chroma theme's free the background free you have everything you one trip to walmart and you could set up the production value that I set up on week one and feel pretty dang proud about it. Right. It's public accessy, and that's what I love about it. And it's charming, yes. and there's hiccups, and I still have a little glow around me. The jacket. Now we have this rad red, like, Elton John jacket. Thank you. <laughs> the Elton John jacket. Yes. And so it's really taken off, and it's been a lot of fun. And it's it's on this end of it, it's nerve-wracking. Like, I don't know who's going to call in next. I don't know what they're going to say. I, I hope they're good. Be funny on the spot. You can write bits, but it's mostly just off the cuff stuff. So yeah, now that we just did a four minute commercial on it, go to go to RFS Dan on YouTube and subscribe to Dantix because it's pretty much been on every week. I don't know what the continuing schedule it is, but I think I have one planned for the Saturday. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah I, it's so fun. It's like you guys that are listening, if you haven't checked it out yet, it's it's totally worth checking out. And I mean, if you're there and it's live and you get to call in, you can call in and talk to Dan and Crystal, and it'll be amazing. It, it's cool. If you answer enough questions, you win. And then when you win, you get your name on the Dan Lee Cup. I have this big, huge <laughs> trophy over there from when I played hockey. And whoever wins every week gets their name on the cup. It's not masking tape with Sharpie marker, but it's just your name on the cup. So it's fun. <laughs> Production value, nothing. It costs nothing to do this. And it is something, like I said, I've always wanted to do. I've always wanted to be a game show person. Right. I think it'll be I think it's really neat and I think uh like you said as it as it goes on and things keep changing. I mean, once who knows, once your channel's monetized and you know, maybe you do start making some pennies from it, what's the next thing? Right now there's no cash and prizes, but who's to say that maybe the winner won't get, you know, something from your merch store or something. Like I I feel like you do you remember Oriental Trading Company? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I that's where like all those balls, can... that's where all those yes. balls that came from, that I, those rubber balls yeah. that I put in my mouth, they were rubber balls, and I was dumping them all I... into my mouth. Yep. Yeah, I, I feel like that. you could order little mini trophies or something from on there that you could mail out to people. You know, I did see that. <laughs> when I was at Party City, when I did the first week, and I tried to get that glitter for my hair, there was oh. a four-pack of mini trophies, and it was like five bucks. So, yeah, you yeah. know, eventually, maybe at the end, somebody will get like a little mini trophy. The thing right. that I'm concerned about, and I know this is so far out there, but it's worth mentioning since it's topical. and Because people at home are probably going like, yeah, Dan, there is game shows like that. It's called HQ Trivia, and it's on Tuesdays and Thursdays and Saturdays. It used to be on every day. And right. uh, they just went under. They their, their, their financing just went under the exact same night that I finished the game show. The really? app that is the most popular game show app has gone folded one under. The hosts came on pretty drunk and just they kind of just didn't care and they bashed this. They kind of bashed HQ trivia a little bit, but HQ trivia was different. You answered questions on the screen. Um, there'd be like a thousand dollar prize if you make it to the end. You might get a penny or two. You know, you can, right. you can cash out. But yeah, they uh they went under. They folded and went under. Um, actually, right after we finished our our game show. So yeah, it's a uh, but. It's kind of scary when you have a big team and employees and everybody that you're trying to pay. Like, as you grow, you just have to take the smart steps. Do you really need 25 people helping they you? They had that. The they show? had 25 people. And Bruce Valanche, yep. and I don't know who was the investors or whatever, but Bruce Valanche was writing for them. I don't know if you know who he is. He's a famous no. TV writer. He wrote everything from Hollywood Squares. He wrote. He writes all the jokes. Oh, okay. It's Bruce. You know, he kind of uh, has like a big old beardish kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So he's he's been a writer. I think he writes the Oscar joke. Like he writes everybody's jokes that come up to the stage. You could pay right. him to write your bits and your stuff. And I believe he was doing the writing on there. That's got to be expensive, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And it's stuff like that. You know, I, I think w when you start to grow and when you start to want to expand, there's smart ways and there's. And then there's just, you know, a, an example of this would be the deli. We have had people begging us to open a second location of the deli 
since we opened. Mm -hmm. They want one on the other side of town. Alpena is not that big. We don't need a second location. At one point in time, we actually did look at a second location. We went out and we looked and we said, man. And then we sat down and I went, why do we need another location with five more employees to cause confusion, another delivery driver, all of this food at a separate location? We do what we do well because of where we are and how we do it. That a second true. location could kill us. It, so It could. We decided against it. We're like, no, we're not doing it. We're not opening a second location. And then there was another small place in town that is a lot like us, opened the same time as us, and they looked at the same location we did, and they opened. Guess what? Didn't last. Gone. No. Uh-uh. Yeah. I, I think the success, too, of the deli is that when I'm in there, it is completely managed. Like, John Carl, John Carl? Yeah, JC, John, everybody else JC, calls him JC. JC, JC, they've got it down. Danielle, they have it down. Everybody, they're, they're not new at this. So, like, it, right. it seems um, secure in there. It seems like everything has a rhythm. There's no surprises. Well, except for when you're there that one time and the freezers stopped working. Yes. Which is ironic <laughs> because you guys literally live in a freezer. But, right. But other than that, like, how could, how could you guys run a second location when you don't have ownership eyes on it? And, and and a second location right. does not mean t- two times profit. No, it, it does, does not. not. It means mean two times two spending. Profit. It might be a tiny bit more profit, but it's two times spending. And your town's small enough that your hammy Sammy does not need to be in two locations within two or three right. miles from each other. You know, so. exactly. You know, there there might be people that come in and help. There might be things that change, but right now, I think it's perfect the way it is. And yeah, I, I think I think it's I think it's working out great. I've been having fun. I, I look forward to it now every week. Like I look forward to my game night. I look forward to it like a, like I do game Aww, night. I'm thanks. Like, this that week means I get to do this. I, it's fun. I like hanging out in the chat and moderating and talking with everybody in the chat. Like I don't know. I just feel like it's it's that once a week hangout with a bunch of people. Aww. You know, I, I enjoy it. So we have hiccups, which is great. Sometimes the callers right. call off. Sometimes I can't hear. My earpiece falls out or I drop a question on the ground. <laughs> right. So it's fun. But that, I think that feeds into the fact that this isn't some, you know, multi-million dollar produced game show. It's you and Crystal in your house. You're literally running a game show from your house. It's just great. I love yes, it. I, I've been having paper. a lot of fun with it. <laughs> yeah. My mom and dad watched it. Are like you they, serious? They, yeah, yeah. Uh, they they watched it. They uh, <laughs> I had shared something and she called me and she's like, when's he going to be live? So oh. they've watched it. So you've, you've got some support oh. and people are enjoying it. So oh, your parents are always so good to me. Yeah, my mom and dad. My mom and dad like to support my friends. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I see where you get it. I see where you get it from. That's for sure. Well, yeah. So thank right? you. Thank you. Come. It's 13 minutes into the podcast. Thank you for <laughs> for bringing that up and, and, and go go see Dantics because uh, I'd appreciate seeing you guys in there. Just come in and at least say hi. Speaking of freezer boxes, what's been going on in your town? Uh, it's been cold. Today, there was like 25 mile an hour winds. Ooh, welcome to my town. Yeah, they closed the Mackinac Bridge. So if you were on the north side trying to get south, well, you're stuck. <laughs> oh, I never thought about uh, it coming back down south. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. If you're on one side or the other of the bridge and you're trying to get north or south and they close the bridge, you can't go anywhere. What are you going to do? Go six hours down south to Chicago and then drive another six hours north? It's 12 hours round trip. Eesh. <laughs> yeah, if you don't want to cross the bridge. Provided that that way it doesn't close for bad weather as well right or traffic or whatever so you know it could take you 15 hours you don't know you are driving to to, through chicago that's Uh. true you gotta get through there quite you gotta drive faster than the bullets right being hurled at you (laughs) (laughs) when you drive through that place we got snow last night we got uh uh, almost five inches of snow that we didn't know was coming so that was so crazy kind of a i went we went to bed last night i was making dinner and i noticed it was snowing and then when I let the dogs out right before bed, I'm like, there's a lot of snow out here. And then when I woke up this morning, sure enough, it was a good five inches. I woke Jamie up and I'm like, we got five inches of snow. And he goes, really? I'm like, yep. He's like, oh, well, I'll get up and snow blow so you can go somewhere. And I'm like, I'm not leaving anytime soon, but thanks. That is so <laughs> crazy. And it's so unexpected. How does that happen? Out here, I can see the weather for the next seven days and it is not going to change. It might be a tiny bit windier. It might be five degrees hotter or cooler, but it's not going to all of a sudden just monsoon or dump five inches five inches of snow and you're not even phased by it when you say it that is incredible amount of snow i can see the weather seven days out on my weather app but that doesn't mean tomorrow it won't be different like 
before Jamie left for Canada, I was really worried that we were going to get a bunch of snow when he was gone because about a week before he left, I looked at the forecast and he was leaving Wednesday and it said it was going to snow Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And okay. I kept thinking, oh my gosh, I'm gonna, we're going to get snowed on for three days and I'm going to have to figure out how to work the snowblower and he's going to be gone. And I, I mean, I could just drive over the snow in our driveway, whatever, not a big deal, but I don't want to turn all that snow into ice and pack it all down. And it just becomes kind of a pain in the butt. So I was already trying to figure out, am I going to have to figure out how to use the snowblower? My, my brother offered to come over, Greg offered to come over, but then he left the day he left, it wasn't snowing and it was supposed to be. And it snowed one night while he was gone. We got like maybe two to two and a half inches of snow. It wasn't much, but it was still enough to where the driveway was covered. And I decided that I was going to get rid of the snow in the driveway because I drove over it. I left. It snowed that night. I left that afternoon to go to the deli and I drove over the snow to back out of the driveway and I drove over to pull back into the driveway and I've been parking in the garage and it just immediately turns that snow to like that hard pack ice. And I had friends that were coming over on Saturday. Greg and Eric were coming over for game night. And in the back of my head, I'm like, I don't want them to drive all over the driveway and wreck. Not that they would wreck it, but we would end up having these ice packs that wouldn't go away until it was warm enough for the snow to actually melt. Or Jamie would have to go out there with like this metal, I don't know, it's not an ice shaver, but that's what I'm thinking of, where he would like have to like chip away all that ice and snow so that the driveway would be flat Um, again. There's no flamethrowers for that? Oh, I'm sure we could get a flamethrower. That'd <gasps> be there? way more fun. I, there, well, I mean, you could buy a, not a flamethrower from the boring company. Oh, that'd be cool. <laughs> See, that's how I need to remove some snow. That would that would be really interesting. No, I ended up uh, being the stubborn person that I am. I refused to call my brother, and I refused to call anybody else to come help me. And I figured out how to use a snowblower that I have never used in the entire time we've owned it. I didn't even know how to start it. Like, I... I had no idea what I was doing. But <laughs> at all? Not at all. You know, no for idea. For everybody at home real quick, your brother literally lives how many? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, six, <laughs> yeah. six seven, six houses away. You can almost yeah, see his much. backyard since since yeah. on a catty corner and you didn't ask him? No, I didn't. I didn't no. ask him. That's Jess. No. <laughs> so I could have Greg said he'd stop on the way home from work and I'm like, No, just go home. No, oh, I, Greg's a good guy. I, I just decided to it was like minus 10 or minus 15 with the wind chill, and I decided I was going to snowblow the driveway, not knowing how to use a snowblower, not even knowing if it had gas in it. I, all I remember Jamie telling me was, make sure you prime the pump. So now I'm looking at this thing going, I don't know what the heck that means. Like, I think I know what it means. Oh, yes. Because I, I had a car many years ago that you had to pump the gas pedal before you could start it. Anybody else remember those? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah, I, I had a lawnmower that had a little little like button that was it was like a little like yes. thing almost like the Reebok pump and I had to like squeeze it a couple yep. times f- for yep. it to prime it yeah I found that and then I'm like I don't think it takes a key I don't think you just turn it and it turns on and then I remembered him telling me how easy it was to pull so I actually had to pull start it and I did it I stood on it and pull started it because I'm five foot nothing and I had to get leverage so. I was gonna say did you and, you and was it hard to start no it started on the first pull oh first you're lucky pull, things started right up did you let out one of those like one of those like screens of just like <laughs> like when you like invent fire or, you know one of those primal screams i could do this i was i was pretty proud of myself but then i uh you know i took it outside to do the driveway and jamie's jeep and his trailer are parked on the left side of the driveway and i wasn't thinking i was just excited i got the thing to start so i started plowing <laughs> the driveway on the right side of the driveway uh-huh. Before I realized that I couldn't throw the snow to the left, so then I got all the way down to the end of the driveway on the third pass, and I went all the way to the left side of the driveway to throw the snow all the way to the right. So I kind of had to redo some of what I did. Totally cool. You know if I were to go out there, that's exactly what I would have (laughs) have done. And you know, and and to come to think about this, I have had more snow-blowing experience than you up until this point, and you live in the snow. Yeah, yeah. You've had more snow-blowing experience with our snowblower. Than right. I did. And guys at home, yeah. keep it keep in mind, and it's in the video. I Jamie let me do a couple passes. Yeah. And just slow. <laughs> yep. And it is so rewarding. Holy cow. How do you not just like want to just go around the whole neighborhood and just blow snow everywhere? It was so cool. Um, so, some people do. Some people that's uh, when we used to live on our at our old house, Jamie used to do that. He would go up and down the sidewalks and do some of the, cause, especially because they were older. So he would just continue down the sidewalk and do everybody's snow. And, you know, some of the older people that 
it was just harder for them to do. We just so shoot it some, out in the street. No, just you know, off to the to the in between the the little side grass there. He would just the same place where they would shovel their snow. He would just shoot the snow off to the side so that their sidewalks would be cleared. That's cool. So you were able to handle that, no problem. Uh, well, I wouldn't say it was no problem. It was heavy and bulky, and apparently I didn't know there was a speed setting on it that would make it, because it's got, like, an automatic drive thing, so you, like, pull a trigger, and it ma- makes the wheel turn to make it easier to push. I didn't realize that you could make it go faster, so I felt like at certain times I was kind of pushing it, and turning it around was really difficult. I didn't know it had a reverse, but apparently it has a reverse, and yeah, it was a... It was a task, and it was really cold, and by the time I came inside, my fingers were frozen. Actually, um, I have a picture of the driveway and what I looked like, because like I said, the wind was blowing a bajillion miles an hour, so we'll have to post that on ccmousepodcast.com. Oh yeah, was it appreciated when the guys got there for game night? Yes, and Jamie really appreciated it when he got home, because he said the same thing. He's like, yeah, the driveway would have been pretty trashed if everybody would have drove over it, because my when he got home, where I drove over it, those lines were still there. Okay, and that packs was, into ice. Yeah, yeah. And then it makes it harder the next time you go to plow the driveway, there's like these two little humps of ice. Oh, okay, so, yeah. Yeah. So that's why I really wanted to do it. I wanted to make sure that it got done. So, But we got about five inches of snow last night, so he got up this morning and went out there and plowed the snow, and he said that. He's like, I am really glad you did that. And I'm like, thanks. Well, good. Now you own, <laughs> now you own that skill, and it, and it makes me think of something real quick. You were like, oh, we got five inches of snow, two inches of snow, and I just drove in it. On Thanksgiving, we got three inches of snow here. You, I know you remember. Everybody remembers. Yep. I told the world, like, this is uncanny in, in SoCal. Right? And we did not celebrate Thanksgiving that day. It turned, like, the snow trumped Thanksgiving. It turned right. into snow day. We had a snow day. We had to push Thanksgiving off a day or two until everything melted and we could drive around. And right. and, and that holiday that's been around forever was replaced by snow day. And it was only three inches of snow. That's how that's how uh, snows looked at here. Right. And they did like, close Meh. our schools today. See, I don't know why, because I didn't think the roads were that bad, but it was wet, heavy snow. A couple places, a couple people had lost power, so they did. So they did close our, Gosh, our schools so today. But stoked on that. Well, so while you were shoveling snow, I actually went on a hike here in beautiful, beautiful California. It was almost seventy degrees. It was like sixty-three degrees out. Holy cow! I live really close to Angeles Forest, which I never go to. But which I should more after going yesterday. It was so beautiful there. It's about an hour away to the top of the mountains, and it's it's like leaving the desert, and you're just you're in the forest. It's a little dry because we kind of have a drought out here, but you're right. still you're still out of you're still out of the desert. You have to drive up one of those crazy sketchy like really two you know two lane roads that have some guardrails. Sometimes they don't have a guardrail. <laughs> It just, it just, it just depends. So I went hiking with Camille from Mueller Huskies. I'm sure you guys all are familiar with who she is by now. And she has two dogs. She has Griffin and Phoenix. And they're really, really, really good dogs. They're really, really good dogs. And uh, this is my first real experience with dogs. Like, I obviously have cats. I've owned dogs. <laughs> you do? <laughs> uh, yes. And, then, you know, and I always try to say, like, I have enough cats that if I, like, rat kingdom together, it'd be like a dog. And what was nice is I only really played with your Huskies. Right. And... Now I was able to play with more Huskies. And when you hug them, they feel like your dogs. So it felt good. Like I was, I was able to hug them and squeeze them and get my dog fixed. And they were licking my face. And the Huskies feel the same. Like like they hug the same. Like when you squish them, you get that same well, like yeah. smiley feeling. So it's one of the I, best things about the breed. <laughs> yeah, I was, I, I was pretty stoked. So I'm new to this. We're going to go on this hike. There's a ton of people. Yesterday was kind of a holiday, you know, yeah, depending on a- what industry you, you work in. So right. you drive up this sketchy road and nobody's around you. There was no traffic on the road. And then all of a sudden I turn the corner and there's like a hundred cars there. Oh, jeez. Yes. Right. And everybody's got their dogs. And so we went walking, we were hiking, call it. It was like a few miles. Wasn't, right. wasn't that long, but it seems like it was that long. It was, a, it was a few hours. And I don't, I'm not sure how like far dogs can walk. Like, I don't know what their pedometers say. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, it was interesting. So I was treating them like cats at first. Like I didn't want to tug the line. I was kind of just letting Griffin because I had I had Griffin and Camille had Phoenix for most of the time. And so that was that was my hike buddy. And oh man, like we we bonded. We <laughs> we definitely 
bonded that day. But yeah, I was treating them like cats at first. I was trying to be nice. I wasn't tugging too hard. When we get to the parts where there was water, I, I didn't know if I was supposed to pick up the dog or or I was like there was like a log that went across the water and I was I don't know if I was trying to get her to balance on it. And then you know <laughs> after I fell, well I didn't fall in the water, but after my shoes got soaking wet and stuff, we just went running through the water. They have four by four mode, and I was not aware of that. The oh dogs, yeah, so. yeah, they're not very dainty. They're not like let's tiptoe around this. I mean, granted at some points, especially. Especially like when Shelby was around, Shelby was afraid of bridges that she could see through. She did and stairs if she could see through them. So if it was like a metal grate stair or a metal grate bridge, whenever we would get to them, her four by four mode would immediately turn to reverse. And it was like, nope, we're not going. Or she would flatten herself as low to the ground as she could get and she would crawl across bridges. So, yeah, there have been many times where Jamie had picked her up and carried her across the bridge or carried her up or down some steps if she freaked out too much. If you could get her in the right momentum on steps, she would do the steps, but she didn't like it. It wasn't something she enjoyed. She's just straight afraid of heights, though, right? Didn't we have an issue with that when we were at the hotel? Yes. Yeah. In the window. Yeah. She was not a big fan of heights. She was not a big fan of if she could see out the window, but not see the ground. Yes. And yeah. When we were when we were at that hotel, when we were out in California, there was that big window. And I think you you were holding her, weren't you? You had her leash. Yeah. And I warned you. I said, you're going to come around this corner. And if she sees out that window, she's going to panic. And then she did. <laughs> yeah. We had to try to straight to elevator because it was two elevators yep. across from each other with at, uh, on the end, a huge window. Yep. Yep. So. I'm like, you can't let her look out the window or else she's going to panic. So, but they, but for the most part, they do have pretty good four by four, four mode, but they also have um, a very fast reverse when they need to. <laughs> Fortunately, I didn't have to do that. And she would have not have liked this because there was a bridge. There was some thin paths. There was lots of looking downs. Oh, yeah. not lots, but, but, but a little bit of looking down. So I'm thinking that she would have not have had a good time on, on this hike. Right. The h- hardest thing for me is other people's pets right i have right. no experience with it i have no experience with body language camille's able to teach me a lot you popped up on my shoulder sometimes you know don't let go <laughs> don't let go dan don't let go yeah don't, don't let, go. let go don't let go that was the only rule that you had for me when we went sledding was don't let go of the dogs just yep. don't so there was a lot of people with with their dogs and camille taught me to like look at their body language look at the owner's body language and the dog would it's just a, run up to you, and all of a sudden yeah. they're just nose to nose, and there's no reaction time of like, what are you gonna do next? Yeah, you you never really know how that's gonna end. And like one of the things like I like to try to teach my dogs when we're walking, I try to teach my dogs to keep moving. I don't like to do a whole lot of that face to face interaction with other dogs because I don't know them, and I don't want my dogs to really be distracted by other dogs on the trail. So. I sometimes I feel bad doing it, but when Jamie and I are walking, we try to continue moving. I don't want a lot of that face to face interaction because, yeah, I can read people's body language and I can read dog body language pretty well, but you still never know what's going to happen. Like Shelby, I'm going to use Shelby as an example again. Shelby was a very, um, she was small dog reactive. But she was only small dog reactive sometimes. Sometimes Shelby could walk past a dog and have no issue. Sometimes we'd be walking past a small dog and she would just, oh, this is my friend and her tail would be going and she was super excited. And then sometimes the small dog would be 25 feet in front of us and Shelby was like, that's it. I'm going to kill that dog. (laughs) Yeah. So I always had to watch her. And like that was always my big fear when we would walk them. So instead of having to constantly have that fear, I kind of tried to train my dogs to just keep moving there is no stopping we're on a mission we're working you're not stopping to say hi to everybody so yeah. i mean we still do but we tr- but i tried to always keep that motion going some good dog owners know the lingo and there's lingo like i heard like some, oh, yeah. there's some little dogs there and stuff and camille is just on by on by and then i'm like what's that mean she's like just like go just go and then so she yep. would say that to the people and they would know that like just let us go by and just let us keep on going and we'll right. keep and we'll keep on going and it's it's and I'm not blaming any dog breeds or anything, but those little dang yap yap dogs think they're 20 feet yes. tall and they're just and it's like, wow, well, that's like you know, it's that's gonna get you punched. It, it pretty much. When I say punch, I mean like dog punch. Like you're you're yeah. asking for to, you're asking for it. So we we did a lot of on on buys is what it, what it was called. Yeah, on buy is a very good command. You use it a lot in dog sledding, and it's basically to keep them focused on what they're doing. Like, if you're running your dogs on a dog sled or you're biking with them, or even when you're hiking, it's a really great command to have your dogs trained, and it just means keep going. That's oh, all it means. It that just was for means the keep dogs. going. 
all this oh my gosh real okay all this time honestly i thought it was to let the other person know that we're going by just hold your dog real quick we'll be out of here we're going right by <laughs> that's what and i was telling people when i said it one time to try to be cool i look i looked at the person and said on by was i that's did they think hilarious. i was commanding them they may have well they did go on by the other thing, though, is it's a very sled dog term. Not a lot of people who don't have northern breeds really use it. It's not something that most people train their dogs. So oh, okay. some of those people might have had no idea what the heck you were talking about right. in the first place. Well, I mean, I'm, yeah, unless they've seen, like, that Cuba Gooden Jr. movie with the right. dogs and stuff. Maybe maybe it was in there. I did. I, I, use, I, I use on by a lot, you know, to keep my dogs moving. Like, if there's a squirrel, you know, you're just on by, on by. Because you want that. What it does, especially if you say it in a very... Uh, like a high pitch or a heightened type of alert, you're distracting them from what they're trying to focus on and telling them to keep doing what you're doing. Don't look that way. Just keep going. Oh, okay. That makes so much more sense now. Oh my gosh. (laughs) I will say though, I will say that secretly um, one time, one time Griffin was kind of like not wanting to walk a little bit and I was all mush. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I didn't know, and and it didn't nothing happened <laughs> i was like mush but i didn't want to say it too loud but i did i did try to use mush oh that's it, hilarious. It worked. i don't know i do i'm not educated in dogs at all although i had the most am- it was so it was so much fun but yeah i did try to did she mush. did you get to use the, the i don't know if her dogs are trained the trail command does she have her dog trained for trail what's that mean so on by is different than trail on by means you want them to keep going the way they're going mm-hmm trail for me for my dogs like if my dogs are starting to turn and they're not supposed to be turning i usually say trail to keep them going straight or like if they start to get too far over to one side of a trail like especially when we're dog sledding if they're starting to get too close to the edge and my sled is going to bump an edge or something like that i'll say trail and they'll kind of just come back to the center um i use that while walking as well though because um I know like where you were walking, there was a lot of narrow trails. Trail is a really good command to keep your dog, to try to keep your dog in the center of a trail. Mm, So like if they're getting too close to the edge, you can be like, you know, go, I I usually say go trail or I'll just say trail, trail, trail. And they'll kind of come back in line into the center to know that that's where they're supposed to be. I know. I sent you that video. And I was like, look what I did. And you're like, oh my gosh, that was scary, Dan. Because I was on this, na- it wasn't that narrow. It looked narrower because I had the zoomed out mode on the iPhone 11. So it kind of looked a little fish-eyed a little bit. And right. you could still see, I mean, you could still see down. And it wasn't until Loki or Steve said like, man, you're lucky like they didn't see a squirrel or a rabbit or something and yeah. go take off running. And I'm like, oh my gosh, thanks to, for introducing a new fear to my life. They were really well behaved yeah. though. But I, I'm not right. sure about that command. I was so stimulated by what was going on and the fact that like I had a dog clipped around my waist, which those leashes that go around your waist are the best ever. I don't know if somebody only invented yes. those a hand year, full of years ago, but I've never saw those growing up. But there was yeah. times where I would look back and everybody would be so far behind me because I was just so concentrated on what was going on in front of me with griffin so i didn't i wasn't aware aware of that part or or of much of the command so they might know more of the commands but i was so stimulated the whole time with just nature and it was so pretty there and right i didn't really really pay attention i had to I had to hop over some rocks go under some trees oh my gosh and it, when you're on those leashes and they go hopping over that rock you're going with them oh yeah yeah they're strong you, kinda, you don't have a whole lot of time to uh to react it's definitely you really do have to be prepared i mean you and like you were saying when you were going down that edge and you sent that video like in my mind i knew that you were that you were okay I watched the video. You were fine. The dogs did fine. But in my mind, if I was in that situation, whoo, I, it would have been, I would have had one dog. Jamie would have had one dog. Jamie would have went down before me because if I were to slip or one of the dogs were to slip, he would have been there to save us because that's, that's what needs to happen. Right. Um, Whenever we're on any type of edge or any type of hill, if I'm going down a hill that, you know, a moderate hill isn't much, but if it's a steep hill and I feel like if I fall, I could slide. I always make Jamie go ahead of me. And I always, we always each have one dog because my dogs could drag me around if they really felt like it. Mm -hmm. You know, they're trained not to, but it doesn't mean they won't. And uh, I was actually, I have it on video and I've never shared it, but we were in the UP one time and I had both dogs and I had them on my, on my belt and it was raining and we came around a corner and there was a hill and I decided to start going down the hill because, you know, like anybody, every once in a while, you kind of go, I can do this. <laughs> yeah, no, not always. 
and I slipped and I just remember yelling for Jamie and the dogs were dragging me down this hill and they at that point in time they thought we were just running and I'm like no we're not running like you know and I told them to whoa and I told them to stop but there was they wanted to get to the bottom of the hill and uh, Jamie had to run past us and actually get us to stop and uh I think I have the whole thing on video because I had the GoPro. I had the GoPro in my hand. It was oh, scary. Wow, that is that is scary. I had both the dogs in the video that I had shown you because we were going down the hill. And, you know, Camille's tough, but yeah. Miller's five foot. And, and there was that one point where she had the dogs and she looked back at me like, I'm starting to slide. And, like, I grabbed on her. We, weren't, we were on flat ground, they, but they were just trying to walk fast. And right. I was, like, grabbing on. Like, well, I got you. So, yeah, you really have to be, you really have to be I, in control. You do. Like, I teach my my dogs know the slow. They know whoa and they know slow. And those are two actually different commands. I use slow when we're going down hills or when we're going down steps. I'll When we're going down steps and I have the dogs, I try to take one step at a time. Even if I could take the steps faster, I try to do everything slowly to teach them that this is what slow means. When we're going down a hill, you know, it's one foot over the other, and I'm telling them the whole time, slow, okay, slow. Wait a minute, I don't say okay until it's time for them to walk, <laughs> but, you know, I just keep telling them slow until we get to the bottom, and then I usually say okay, or I say break, so that they know they can get back out in front of me and walk at a normal pace. But it's, there's a lot that goes into it. You can get hurt, you know, if you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> oh, I'm scratched up. I took a spill. I've scratched my back trying to go under a tree stump. I stumbled a few <laughs> times. I got, my feet were drenched, which I love. I, and I loved all of it. Like I had such right. a good time. I loved, I loved all of it. The, I, I, I was a little scared. You can hear my voice. I was a little scared and apprehensive and I had to try to calm down because I know animals can read your body language when other right. dogs would just kind of come up like you said really fast or there were some that were off leash and there was yeah. literally a hundred people there this wasn't like a park this yeah. was trails and stuff and and the dog came up and i can see the dog look happy but i don't know i mean i look happy you know so yeah. I, I i i was scared a little bit you could hear me I, I was i was scared a little bit and i didn't know what to do and and that's why i learned i learned the to read the people's body language and i learned to read the dog, yeah. dog's body language but i don't have enough time behind the wheel of the dog so it didn't matter to me each time i was nervous well i mean even me i have you know a lot more experience years of experience with dogs than you do and off-leash dogs scare me i most people that watch my stuff and you know know what i do know that i am one of the biggest on-leash people ever i don't care if your dog is trained and can do everything you say at every single command there is absolutely no reason when you are in a public area especially with a lot of people why you should have your dog off leash it's not safe for your dog and it's not safe for the dogs around you because it only takes one second for something to go wrong and you know your dog may come back to you every time you call them for a thousand times but that thousand and one time, for some reason, that dog decides not to come back. That's when an accident will happen. There's actually a, I don't know if it's a poem, it's a little story written, and it's called Trust is a Deadly Disease. And it's not saying that you shouldn't put some trust into your animals, but it's just saying when you get to that point where you feel like you can fully trust your animal and you, you know, your dogs, and you, for that moment, let go and just be like, no. My dogs come back to me every single time I've called it. That thousand and one time when the door flies open and your dog takes off and you call it and it doesn't come, that could that could mean life or death for your dog. They could get hit by a car. They could we had a police dog here, a police dog, a fully trained canine unit police dog that took off after a deer while searching for somebody lost in the woods. And he never he he didn't respond. And this was 20 years ago before gps collars before there was all these like tracking systems they can put on canine units now this was before any of that before like drones were easily accessible that dog took off after a deer and they never found the dog this fully trained canine dog didn't listen to one command just yeah. one time and that's the thing like i i get it i get a lot of people they get really really mad at me and they get really upset when I say that I believe dogs should be on leash when they're in public areas. I really, but I, I am a firm believer. I've, I've, I've been around a while. I I'm don't not... feel like that's an unreasonable statement to make. It takes three doors to get out of your house and your dogs are well-trained. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, yeah I, I just, I don't get that part. 
I, I'm, I'm I'm definitely a helicopter dog mom. I I believe that all dogs should be on a leash when you're in public. I, if you're now if you have a dog that you've trained to be off leash and you're 20 miles out on a hiking trail and you're out in this area where there there's absolutely nobody and you want to work with your dog off leash, that's 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 up to you. Like that's that's on you if your dog gets hurt sure. or you know that's. But you're not there with a hundred other people. You're not there with a bunch of people walking up on you. You're out there. You're pretty much out there all by yourself. If you're an off-leash trainer and that's how you train, I'm all, you know, that's okay. That, I wouldn't do it, but good for you to work with your dog like that. Like, it's just not something I would do. I don't think less of somebody because they choose to do that. But I do think less of the people that think it's okay to have their dog off-leash when there's other dogs around, other people around, and you're just in such an unpredictable situation. Right. Wow, you, you know, really you have to know... qualify everything you say, don't you? Oh, yeah. I mean, <sighs> you, it, I do. You, you'll you be surprised. What I have just said will upset somebody. Somebody oh, yeah, will absolutely. read that wrong and think that I'm picking on the off-leash dog community. And I'm not picking on the off-leash dog community. I praise those people who can have their dogs off-leash and train them and let them go out swimming in a lake. My dogs are on a leash when they swim in the lake. And I get people that pick on me for it. But I'm a helicopter dog mom. I'll fully admit it. I'm not going to trust my dogs 100% because it's my job to protect them. And it's the same thing. I'm not saying that the off-leash dog community doesn't think they're prote- not protecting their dogs. I'm sure they love their dogs just as much as I love my dogs. It's just a difference in training and a difference in the way we do things. Right. And I I have very strong opinions on Oh, I can, I can tell. But as someone like me who has no dog experience, it was scary when right. they were and, and I wasn't looking at the owners the owners are 10 yards back I'm busy looking at this dog coming at me trying to not give off a panic vibe to set the dog off so I don't know it's not like he's a person that's from the FBI that knocks on your door and you're like who's this and they flash a badge and you're like checks out like there was right. no credentials there was nothing there wasn't a scarf around its neck or a, a leash color if that's a thing or, right. or, or, right. or, or a painted toenail that says that they're good they're happy they're approachable you right. know and I I was uncomfortable, but I'm uncomfortable because another, I'm uneducated. And right, and that's another really good example of why it is it is a responsible thing to have your dog on a leash when you're in a public area with a lot of people. Because what if you, even if you didn't have a dog with you, what if you were kind of scared of dogs and this off-leash dog comes up and decides to try to greet you and you're scared of dogs? You may go into a full-on panic attack. You don't know. <laughs> yeah, he might not like my Calvin Klein perfume. Right. You just have to. I, my biggest thing when it comes to dog ownership is you have to have respect for the people around you. And part of I think part of having respect for people around you is keeping your dogs under control with you and safely on a leash when you're in a public area. Yep, when and you're I out in the middle of way. nowhere. Yeah. When you're out in the middle of nowhere and you want to let them run free, that's on you. Again, I wouldn't do it. I don't suggest anybody do it. But if that's what you want to do, that's on you. In my mind, they, it was it hurt me because I did not know what to expect. Right. Like they right. know what to expect. They're like, ah, it's fine. Yeah, right. but look at my body language, sir. Like I, you know, and I had control of Griffin the whole time. I had there's the long leash and there's this little cool little loop. Man, you guys have thought of it all these days. There's this cool little like <laughs> loop on the leash halfway down, so I can get closer. Yep. Um, I can get closer to it, like a harness, and I never really had to do any like tug or anything. But I was ready for some sort of pulling away. What if they got into a fight? How do you pull away the dog when there's nothing to pull away? The biggest thing, like if especially if you're out there and there becomes a dog fight, one of the best things you can do, and because you're hiking, hopefully you had it anyway, is water. Yes, water usually can break up a dog fight pretty quick. If you have like a water bottle that has a spray thing on the top of it, if a dog fight happens, spray water in their eyes. Like they'll let go, and usually it's enough time to get them apart. Right. Like that's that's water. When when I used to go to the private dog park, that was the thing. We always, we had squirt bottles everywhere, and we had hoses accessible, and that was what people were told. If for some reason something happens, grab the hose. You should never reach in. That's me. I mean, yeah, but it, I mean that would be me too. If you absolutely have to, you're gonna reach in there and you're gonna. That's try my to instinct. Help your but I, I if I and I asked, I think I asked Mueller about that. I was like, do I just stop? And it's like, no, you're gonna get bit. Yeah, you'll get bit. And then and then the dog will focus, uh, instead of on the dog, it's going after, it may turn its focus on you, and right. then you're going to get bit worse. And, and at then it that just point, becomes... it is my fault. Yes, yeah. Like, it, well, not my necessarily. my fault for trying to jump in like that, when, you know, right. so, yeah. So but water, water is the biggest tip. <laughs> that's that's good to know but fortunately there was no incidences there was no nothings it, um, a lot of a lot of everybody's thing was uh all bark oh it's they're all bark so it was interesting it was interesting to 
to learn so much. There's so much more to dog yeah. caring than just having dogs. Yeah, oh yeah. Man, we, could do a, a, we could do a whole podcast on this. Right? Again. I think we did. Oh my <laughs> gosh, yes, 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 yes we did. We completely recorded a 90-minute podcast this morning. Yep, It's too did. late, we gotta say it. We recorded a 90-minute podcast, we talked about all the stuff that we just talked about, and a hundred right. more things. It went into this greatest conversation ever. Yeah. And then the audio was unusable at the end. So yep. we're here to record it. And I'm trying not to repeat like some of the stuff we said. Like all the stuff before we talked about the dogs, all the all the stuff in the beginning, that was all new. But yep, we've we, we, new. we've had this conversation already once today and it was it didn't hit home like the first one, but you know, we got it out. <laughs> and there's so much to say. I have two more pages of notes about this, but we're already almost at an hour. But we should really do well, a dog podcast to educate people like me that don't have dogs or want a dog on what it's like to what the responsibilities are of having a dog. That would be really fun to do. But to get like maybe Camille on here and maybe Steve, like some of our really close like dog friends mm-hmm. to get to get them all on here and like kind of have that conversation you know like and you could have like a list of questions and then and go I through do. and ask everybody i have a and huge like, list of questions that would be fun even if it was a bonus podcast like it doesn't have to like we could still have a normal podcast but then it could be like a bonus episode here's a bonus episode just for fun yeah we, we could do that because there's a lot of things that i feel that people should know that don't know anything about dogs like me so i'm gonna come with all these uneducated questions but more right. people are uneducated about dogs than are educated about dogs so maybe it'll True. be a, a good listen because there's some easy stuff that you guys probably take for granted that i didn't that i don't even know on by i thought we were talking to the people like i had a dog growing up and it was the family dog when i was a kid and it lived in the backyard right. all the time we never ran it we never played with it it tried to eat a can that that the lid wasn't taken off all the way of it and we had to like we had to have surgery on it so they could take the can out of his mouth and like just so uh. like so much irresponsibility from uneducated no one ever told us we were doing it wrong no one ever told us that hey maybe your dog wouldn't chew up the side of its house if you took it for a walk or you ran it or you got its energy levels out right Right. Some people don't know that. I mean, that's that's the reason a lot of dog, people get dogs and then they get rid of them. They just don't have the information and the education available to them to know how to fix the problems they have. I mean, look at how many people you, you see the groups that I've run, the pet groups that I run. Look at how many people get mad at me when I suggest they go to a trainer when they're having issues and I suggest them going to a trainer and they freak out. Out. I had a girl send me the most nasty messages and she had a supposed service dog. I don't really think it was a service dog. I think it was because especially because of how it was trained. It was not a legit service dog. It was her quote unquote service dog that she trained. And when I suggest she went to a trainer because of the problems she was having with this dog. Oh my gosh. It was like lighting a fire. It was I was the most horrible person in the world, and how could I suggest that? And I don't have the money for a trainer, and that's not the issue. The issue isn't I need a trainer, and I'm going, but you, the problems you're having could be solved by being with somebody that understands the problems. Somebody like McCann Dogs, who's been in the dog training business for 30 years and who've seen this issue before, is literally going to be able to sit down and be like, we've seen this before, here's the issue, let's try this. If that doesn't work, we can try this. If that doesn't work, we can try this. But to suggest to somebody to go to a dog trainer and them to freak out is just, it's a big red flag, you know? And I get it, dog trainers do cost money, but... If you really are committed to helping your dog, you'll find a way. It is true. And people like McKen, they do good jobs on trying to educate you because and that's probably why they do this is because they're probably sick of like so much uneducation of stuff. Yep. There's oh, yeah. misinformation. 100%. There's And there's a bunch of ways to do stuff. I, I, I get it. But it's education. When I got my new car, they showed me the stuff in the car. They showed me how the car worked. I had to take it for a test drive and stuff. It's, that should be the same way when you get a dog. You should have to take classes. You should have to know right. the breed you're getting. You should have to watch a video or, or or take a test. You should have to take a dang test to be like, what is, you know, this kind of breed of dog is like this way and and and, and that kind of breed of dog is like that way and like there well, should be more to it. And that's kind of like I mean, and I'm going to I'm going to go into it again. <laughs> Even though I did all this. Do you want to? Oh, yeah, I'm going into it again, especially because you're making the point of it. You know, I you know that I'm a big supporter of responsible, reputable breeders. And one of the reasons behind that is responsible, responsible, reputable breeders have application processes that you have to go through before you can get a 
purchase a puppy from them. But they also, they do screening. They talk to you. They learn about what is your life like? How is your work schedule? Do you have children? How much experience do you have with the dog? And then as their puppies start to grow and they, they learn more about the personality of each puppy they have, they will fit the puppy to you. I didn't pick Memphis. The breeder picked Memphis. I didn't pick Kira. The breeder picked Kira. We didn't get to pick our puppy. Our puppy was picked for us based on what they knew would work well with us. When it came to Kira, there was two females and there was, um, I really wanted the black and white over the gray and white, but they kind of wanted me to have the gray and white over the black and white because she was so smart. She was the smartest dog in the litter. And then it came down to they had somebody that was going to be doing a lot of competition agility. And as soon as that happened, it was like, nope, the gray and white female needs to go to these people because she's the smartest puppy in the litter and they're going to be doing competition agility and things like that with her. Mm -hmm. So they need a really smart dog. And they knew that and they said, okay, this dog's going to them. This dog is going to them. They... People don't realize, if they've never actually worked with a responsible breeder, how much care they put into where their puppies go. And I think, I wish more people knew that, that that was how it worked. I mean, you have the people, you know, the adopt, the adopt don't shop campaign that goes on, which I think is a very damaging campaign. I, I am a full believer in adopt or shop. I think nobody should be shamed if they want to adopt a dog. Nobody should be shamed if they want to get a dog from a responsible, reputable breeder. If you're doing it the right way, that should be all that matters. You know, if you're going out there and you're doing your research, because not every breed of dog is right for every person. Right. And people don't realize that. You can't work 12 hours a day and bring a working dog into your home unless you are willing to commit four hours every day after work and put it into working your dog and giving them what they need as their purpose bred, what they're purposely bred for. You know, you don't want to have a husky and never let it run because you're going to have a very unhappy dog and they're going to tear apart your walls and they're going to eat your shoes and they're going to destroy everything. We did have an unhappy dog. He chewed the side of the house like a goat and... And I was just a kid, but looking back, nobody was educated. Nobody paid him that attention. And it's embarrassing, yep. Like, but that's what happened. It's embarrassing. But if there was some more education or somebody else could, could have shown that these aren't just pets that are here for your pleasure. These are living right. things. These are your kids. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, they are. You know, you know, it, they, it was hard. I, I bet right now, because I was at the pound on Saturday, I might be able to go down the street and come home with a dog tonight. Oh, yeah, I bet you could. And that I is irresponsible. Walk in there. They're not going to ask you if you have a fenced in yard. They're not going to. They may ask you like when uh, when I w- volunteered for our our old shelter, not the one, not ACAF. When I volunteered for the Humane Society that's here, we had a, like an application process. And the only thing it said was, do you have a fenced in yard? Do you have a job? Where do you work? Do you have other pets? And that was it. None of it ever mattered, though. Like you could say yes or no to all those things. And they would still let you take a dog. Usually the only red flags where they wouldn't let you take a dog home was if you had a dog that currently wasn't fixed, they wouldn't let you have a dog. That was like, that was their thing. Oh, your dogs aren't fixed. Doesn't matter that you don't have a fenced in yard. You work 12 hours a day. You, you know, you've had dogs before that you gave away for some other reason. None of that mattered because they had a dog and it was there and they had to, they had to get it out of the shelter. That's another reason why I'm such like, I push so hard towards breed rescue as well. Um... Like, mutts are great. I don't want people to think that I, I'm against mutts and I'm only for purebred dogs. That's not what I'm saying. Mutts make amazing dogs. But purebred dogs do also have benefits when you get from, like, you know, responsible, reputable breeders. You know the temperament and the personality types that those dogs are going to have. Mm-hmm. We all know that huskies are high energy. They're crazy, but they're also really good companions. Like we we know that labradors and golden retrievers make great family pets. They do need play and, you know, love and they need work as well, but they make great family pets because that's what they're bred for. Like they they have that in them. That and, makes sense. And that's the thing, like shelters and like animal controls and things like that, they don't really look at the people and look at the dog and try to match the right people to the right dog where uh, breed specific rescues have really long application processes and they do try to fit 
these dogs that have been tossed from home to home and now are in these breed specific rescues, they have these long application processes because they actually try to fit the right dog with the right people. I've done, you know, gone through application processes with people where you fill out the five page application and then you have a phone interview. And then after the phone interview, it's now you have to have somebody come out to your house and they actually do these, it's called a home check. And I've done them. Yeah, and I've recently. gone to people's. Yep, I've gone to people's houses with my three pages worth of paperwork where I have to walk in and, you know, is the house clean? Does it look nice? Are the other dogs friendly? Is there a fenced in yard? Um, you know, are there latches on the windows? And it seems like really petty, silly things. But when you're dealing with an animal that's been tossed from home to home to home, you really are trying to fit that animal with the right family. And not every dog is fit for every family. And I think that, you know, like breed specific rescues do a much better job of actually trying to fit the right dog to the right family. Yes. Same thing with responsible, reputable, bre reputable breeders. They want to fit the right dog to the right family. No different than if you were to get a child via adoption. Exactly. Exactly. It's, it's not an easy thing to do. Yeah. And I can see them not giving a dog to a family who has other animals that aren't fixed because they're gremlins. They're just multiplying. That's the problem is there's too many right. dogs per per people, I think. Yeah. I think the last time I did the research on it, and this may be a few years old, but... Um, I had done research on it for uh, one of the things we were doing. I don't remember what it was, but it's for every adult, I believe it is, you would have to adopt six dogs and 11 cats for there to no longer be a homeless animal situation. That is ridiculous. Yeah, six dogs Holy and cow. 11 cats per person. So like in your house, you know, you'd have to have 33 cats. Wow. Wow, that's yeah. that Isn't is it? that is out of control. And as sad as it is, there's just not enough people as there are homeless animals because too many people view animals as a throwaway. I'll get it if I don't like it, I can give it away. And that's not to say that there aren't situations where the dog or cat really should go to a different home. You know, sometimes people end up getting really sick and their family members can't take the animals. I'm not saying if you're in a situation where you have to give up an animal that you shouldn't. If, if giving up the animal is the right thing to do, then that's the right thing to do. Not that it's not hard, and if you've exhausted all your other options and it's still the right thing to do, then you still need to do what's best for the animal. And that's sometimes that is letting them go to a different home or you know, letting them go to a breed rescue or taking them to a shelter. It's a yeah. hard decision, but sometimes it is the right decision. Right, yeah. and But too many people view it as the easy decision. Yes, and this takes me back to, again, when we were hiking on the trail, and I heard it a little bit, but Mueller caught it, and there was a family walking by with no dogs, and because there's a gajillion dogs there. And right. one of the people in the group said, I don't care what dog it is, I just want a dog. And <laughs> that did not go over well. Yeah, yeah. That's dangerous. It is. It's very dangerous. That's dangerous because you have an expectation in your head of what you think the dog's going to be, and it might not be that. Do you remember the, I mean, I guess the movie came out before we were born, but you probably remember hearing the stories about it. The, and it, when, it, when the live action came out, it happened again. Do you remember the Dalmatian craze? Oh my gosh, yes. So when 101 Dalmatians came out, yes. everybody wanted a Dalmatian. The problem was, is everybody just went to every backyard breeder and, you know, pickup truck at Walmart and bought these Dalmatians. Dalmatians are a very, uh, they have a lot of genetic issues. Blindness, deafness, both run in the breed. And, um, and there's a lot of reasons that it has to do with. But if you just buy a Dalmatian from anybody, you could end up with a Dalmatian that by the age of two is completely deaf. Wow. If you're using responsible, reputable breeders, they try to do lots of testing. And if they end up with, like, if they have a litter of puppies and one of their puppies is deaf, that's it. Those two, those mom and dads don't make puppies anymore. And all of those puppies then have to be fixed. Like, they try to, you know, work to weed these genetic defects. That sounds so, that sounds so cold. These genetic defects, these genetic issues. I get what you're out saying. Out of the dogs, you know, like, yeah. So, but... Because people didn't care and they just wanted a Dalmatian because they saw it and it was cute, they got Dalmatians. And it created my my cousin, who actually lives out by you, out in California, rescues deaf Dalmatians. 
No. Because there were so many. He wow. did it for years. I believe he still does, but that was his rescue dog of choice. He learned how to do sign language with dogs, and he only rescued deaf Dalmatians because there were so many of them. Well, I yeah, was it, unaware of that. I had no idea. Yep, yep. I think I've it's only very, seen one Dalmatian in my life, so I haven't they're seen not, very many. They're not as popular now as they were at one point in time, but at one point in time, they were. Uh, you can use the same thing. People will tell you that people started getting huskies because of Game of Thrones. I don't necessarily know that that's 100% true because the popularity of huskies was on a huge uptick before Game of Thrones. I don't think Game of Thrones helped you know, in the popularity of the breed, but I don't necessarily think that they that you can blame them for the popularity of the breed. I see so many huskies out here. The other day, remember we were on the phone the other day, and I was like, oh my gosh, there's somebody walking a husky. There's huskies. Yeah. There's huskies all over the place here. And you know what? Tell that to Nemo. You know, remember when Finding Nemo came out, the clownfish yes. craze? That was yep. another thing, too. Everybody wanted a clownfish. Everybody wanted they a clownfish. Didn't, they didn't know how to take care of it. They, they didn't, didn't know how to take care of a saltwater tank. Right. Right. They didn't and, understand and that just, you have to let it run for a long time before you can even put a fish in there. Yep. And that's kind of the thing. Like, huskies have become popular because of certain TV shows. You know, But like I said, they were on an uptick before that, so it's it's hard to say it was all Game of Thrones' fault. But Game of Thrones didn't help. No, it did not help. And that's the thing. People see them, and they go, oh my gosh, I want a dog like that because it looks like a wolf, and I'm going to name it after the wolf in this TV show. And then they get the dog, and they don't have a clue because backyard breeder Betty doesn't care who she sells her dogs to and she's got 52 huskies that she just breeds and breeds and breeds and sells the dogs for it's so crazy I I saw a lady the other day say that she she bought these two huskies brother and sister and she spent $1,600 a piece on these dogs $1,600 per dog and then she writes I don't know if they're really huskies because she wouldn't let me see the parents. I'm going to put it out there, full disclosure. I did not pay $1,600 for either of my dogs. And my dogs are from Champion Bloodlines. I thought you were going to, okay. Because when you said $1,600, I, I could look at Memphis and go like, yeah, you're worth $1,600. So I couldn't tell if that price was high or not. It is. $1,600 for a Siberian Husky is ridiculous. But people are paying it because they don't. They don't know what a responsible breeder is. A person that's going to charge you $1,600 for a husky. This reminds me of back in the day before the laws really came into effect where you couldn't solicit in front of supermarkets. There would be people with their boxes of dogs and their boxes yeah. of cats and they'd be holding oh, them yeah. by the scruff trying to be- sell you. Yeah. Betty. Is that what that's called? And like I said, a lot of those people, you know, they have, you know, a whole bunch of dogs and that's all they do is they breed dogs yes. and they turn around and they sell them and they take advantage of people. Shelby was a dog that was listed in the newspaper and we saw the ad and we had Shiloh oh. at the time and it was shortly after Shiloh had passed away and we decided we were going to go look at these puppies. My sister actually talked me into Jesus. going to look at these puppies and it was one of those things where it was like okay, we're going to go look at these puppies. And we went, and Dan, it was horrifying. They, the lady had, I think she had nine huskies, and they were all living outside in the mud and the filth, and these puppies were disgusting. And it was it was the worst situation to buy a puppy from this person. I never should have supported this lady and bought this puppy. But at the time, I didn't really know what a backyard breeder was. I didn't know that there were actually people that bred dogs. You know, like I knew there was show dogs and I knew there was, you know, people that would breed for like specifically breeding for sled dogs and things like that. But I didn't know that that wasn't everybody. We got Shelby and we got her at six weeks old, which was horrible. Dogs, puppies should not. A good, responsible, reputable breeder will not let a puppy leave its home it leave its mom until they know it's ready and they'll know uh we got kira kira was nine weeks old when we got her but shelby was six weeks old because her mom at three weeks old completely stopped feeding them her mother was nine years old when she had this litter of puppies wanted nothing to do with them attacked them all the time shelby had a scar on her head from where her mom attacked her as a puppy the day we picked her up yeah like so this woman let us have this dog at six weeks old and 
Oh, there's there's a lot of reasons that puppies should stay with their mother and their siblings for as long as possible. I have friends of mine as breeders that don't let their puppies leave till they're 12 weeks old because they feel like it's it makes a better rounded puppy. And I don't doubt it. I really don't. There's no reason to rush taking a puppy away from its mom. It's traumatic for the puppy. It's traumatic for the mom. It's traumatic for all of them. So I, I definitely don't, you know, I, I see the perks of... I understand that it should be up to the breeder to know when the puppy is ready to go. And anybody that's like, oh, I want this dog right now, you just got to be patient. But I got Shelby from a backyard breeder. You know, yeah, she wasn't selling him in a box outside of Walmart, but I, she, uh, she was an ad in a paper. We went, drove over there and picked her up. And it was after I got Shelby was when I really started to do my research. Like, I reported this lady. I reported her to animal control because the place was filthy. She also had uh, York Yorkshire Terriers that she was breeding as well, but she kept those in the house. And I think she had 20 of them in the house. Wow. It was, yeah, it was ridiculous. She was a puppy mill. I mean, she was just without all the cages. She was, it was bad. Was it a puppy mill for profit? Oh, like, yeah. They yeah were just, they were just dollar signs out there? Yep. That's all she did. She didn't work. She bred dogs. That's wow. all she did. That is yeah. that is crazy. Well, I so I went to the pound on Saturday. We call it the pound out here, like pound puppies, like it's it's the pound. It's right. not like a rescue or anything like and there was three big long corridors for dogs. And yeah. there was only like three types of dogs there. And yeah. there was a couple huskies. Of and course. everybody wanted the husky. Everybody was crowded around the huskies. There's a white one named Ruth. Of course. And, and then there was another, there was an Oakley. I saw an Oakley, blue eyes, everything. This, it was yeah. the color. It was Oakley. I took a picture, but I couldn't find it in me to send it to you. <laughs> <laughs> and then there was a couple of regular sized dogs, like a, some like lab mixes and stuff like that. And then there was one right. huge lawn corridor that reminded me of like the Green Mile of nothing but pit bulls. Yep nothing that but pitbulls i was me. counting 20 30 pitbulls in there more than half the population in there was pitbulls yep and that's that was how hard a lot to of see. shelters are it's how a lot of shelters are it goes back to that same thing people get dogs that they don't understand because they think that's they think that's what they want and you know pitbull pitbull isn't actually like a breed it's more of like a combination you know there's there's some people refer to the american staffordshire terrier as pitbulls they're bully breeds, I guess you could say. Uh, okay. Um, there's I, I, multiple different bully breeds. Oh, yeah, there's American I, Bulldogs. Some people confuse American Bulldogs as pit bulls. So the, and I'm just going to call them pit bulls because that's what most people okay. call them. I, I, I'm uneducated. It's like the beige one with that head that you just see those muscles, yep. that head. And then they have like biceps that are bigger than mine and stuff. There's a breed called the American Pitbull Terrier. Mm hmm. Um, and a lot of times, you know, there's the American Pit Bull Terrier, there's the Staffordshire Terrier. They call them the bully breeds, not like because they're mean, just because that's what they are. But like the the actual American Pit Bull Terrier is not an AKC dog. Like they, they can be registered. There's different kennel clubs that register dogs. There's like the United Kennel Club and there's like the American Dog Breeders Association. And there's a bunch of different kennel clubs. There's a Continental Kennel Club. But the AKC, which is the most popular one here in the United States, doesn't actually recognize the American Pit Bull Terrier breed, but they do the Staffordshire Terrier breed, which they're very similar, but there are a few differences. But, but yes, they call them the bully breed. So there is a there is a breed of dog called the Pit Bull, but a lot of the times, Pit Bulls that you see in shelters aren't necessarily a purebred Pit Bull. They're usually a combination of multiple of those breeds. Uh, okay. but, but they're a great big dog with a big strong dog strong dog they look and, uh, strong yes they are and that's the problem people get them and they don't realize that they're this big strong magnificent animal and they can't control them because they don't know anything and then they just give them up or they get them because they want them to protect them they want i want a dog that can protect my home that'll scare away intruders which i'm sure you heard them bark some of them sound terrifying it was deafening in there and it was sad because i was the only one in there to see them it, in that and it's sad because they're an amazing breed of dog the pit bulls the bully breeds they are they're a working horse dog i mean they are they're an amazing breed and when you know when you put the work into them just like huskies when you put the work into them they're an amazing dog but people just aren't 
willing to put the work in. That is true. Everything's amazing when you put the work into it. But like I said, everybody just wanted the husky. And they were yep. after Ruth, the white one, the one that looked like Ghost from Game of yeah. Thrones. Yep. You know, so, yeah. it's, but that's how it works. Things spark your interest. And that's why you want that car because you saw it on TV. And that's why you want that hockey stick because you see your favorite play, player playing with it. So right. I get the desire for that, but wow, I feel like there should be classes of education or something. It should be a better way to, even for shelters, to to pair people with a dog. But people don't want that. They don't want, you know, when you walk in and they say, oh, I work 12 hours a day and I want a Husky. They don't want somebody no. to say, you know, you might think twice about that because if you're gone 12 hours a day, this dog's going to rip your house apart. They don't want to hear it. They don't care. They don't want to listen. They just want what they want because that's what they think they want. And that's it's a dangerous... It's why we have so many dogs in shelters and breed rescues and animal controls. It's why thousands of dogs are euthanized every year because people don't, they aren't educated. They don't, they don't want to listen. How much of it is the responsibility of the actual place where I was at versus the people that are walking out of there with that dog? <sighs> you know, when it comes to animal controls and shelters, they are so underfunded. It's really hard for it to be fall in their hands they want to get those animals out of there because not all of them many places are no kill now but a lot of them if they don't move those animals out then the animals get euthanized and that's the thing like what do you do do you screen these people or do you just cross your fingers hand them the dog and hope it works out and i'm and i'm talking of, of somebody with no education on this i'm asking these questions honestly i don't know this stuff Right. I don't oh, hope yeah, I don't I offend it. anybody or I hope I didn't say anything sensitive or, or incorrect. I don't have this knowledge. I have friends that have right. dogs. My best friend has two huskies. <laughs> <laughs> like, but I don't have this education. And I think a lot of people, most people don't. Right. I can recognize I don't have the, what it takes to own a dog. Right. I don't. But as somebody that's curious about it, and, and I got to check one out, I got to rent a dog yesterday. You know, like we, we yeah, had fun and, and stuff. Um, I'm curious. Even doing that, I I feel like I should be more educated before I take on that responsibility. Yeah. Even just yeah. for the day. There's wow. a lot of things we're allowed to do that we don't have to be educated in that people just hope turn out right. And sometimes it does, and sometimes it, it just doesn't. They Wow. Well, I encourage you guys to educate yourself. Please, please really educate yourself. And when you're done educating yourself, turn to the next person next to you and educate them too, please. And then ask them to educate another person. Yeah. Maybe maybe you go over to your friend's house and, and their dog's just in the backyard not doing much. Maybe you should mention like, hey, are you running your dogs? Or like, hey, why don't we all go for a walk? And, and maybe you could show them what the dog's like. Run the dog for them one time or even for a week if you have that time. And, and then show them at the end of the night how they're well behaved or that they're not chewing up the dog house like mine. Right. When I was a kid. It's a, it's a hard thing though because, you, you know... When it comes to pet ownership and how to, it's it's a it's a very it's a hard community to be a part of because everybody thinks what they're doing is right and everybody wants to tell everybody else that what they're doing is right and what you're doing is wrong. So sometimes it can become a conversation that you may try to be having with somebody and you're doing it out of the goodness of your heart, but they don't see it as that. Like so this one here. I'm yeah, really wondering yeah. what's going to come out of this this one here. You're in a hard vertical, and and I wonder what it's like to be in a in a child development vertical where the oh, people God, right? are really doing this. You know, because everything we say here applies to human beings as far as like, are you ready to have a child? Should you right? should you have a child at this age? You know, children education should be important as well. So I wonder what that's like on YouTube of the people that have yeah. to deal with uh, shots versus no shots and and stuff like that. So. Whew. Yeah, I mean, I, I I deal with it on a daily basis. I get told a lot of the things I do wrong. I make a dog treat. If I put food coloring in it, I was wrong for putting food coloring in it. I, That's I right. buy a puppy from a responsible, reputable breeder. I get told I was wrong for not rescuing a dog. I had people unsubscribe, flat out saying in the comments, I'm unsubscribing. You didn't rescue. You yep. chose a breeder over a rescue. And you know, it's it's it is what it is. Like, yes, that's what I did, and and I don't feel like people should be shamed for making that choice. But the dog community, the pet community, can be very it can be very toxic. I there's a reason I don't make training videos. There's a reason I kind of strayed away from Fan Friday because there would be things I was answering, and you know, I would always try to tell people this is just my opinion, but they don't care if I said it and it wasn't what they thought and it was. It, it just it creates it creates fire and and I'm not saying I, I agree with you Dan I think that people should try to have these lines of communication with friends of theirs and they should try to educate others 
But just be prepared. There are going to be some people that will have a massive pushback because of it. And if they do, that's okay. Just walk away. <laughs> right, right. Even from this. That's what I'm, I do. I'm like, I'm like, oh, the crazy people are back. And I, uh, okay, I'm just not, I'll just delete that comment. I, okay, thanks. Bye. <laughs> right, right. And if you're listening to this and you're upset and you have a dog vertical, educate the people. Educate the me's. Educate the people that don't know. Yes, I am naive at this. Yes, I do not know what I am talking about. I only have a right. little bit of data. But with that data, I could go and get a dog right now and still and be irresponsible. Like I know just enough to right. be dangerous. So teach right. people like me. Tell me I'm wrong in the comments. Show us show me your way. Show everybody away anything's better right. than nothing right nothing at all i feel like I, those people I standing in line when i was there at at the pound like I, they should all be given cards of channels of like go watch this go get educated it, there should be like the people that work there should be encouraging you to go to people's youtube pages or go to go to a reputable site that you can learn because right. they are living things they are and they're living things that you are committing to for depending on the breed of dog the next you know eight to 20 years of your life you you have to be there for them you're taking care of them you're protecting them you're you're the ones that taking them to the vet and making sure they're eating the right food and questioning everything you do because is this the right thing that i'm doing or should i be doing this differently it's it's no different than when you raise a child and you want to make sure that you're doing everything right for them. You know, a lot of people go through the exact same waves when they're raising their dogs. Is this right. the right thing to do? Should I be doing it this way? It's it's not just here's a dog and I'll just throw it out in the yard and it'll be fine. No, most people actually care. And, and I do see that with you and how much you care and how much you're changing diets and how much you're trying to fix things and how much you're pointing out that that little jar of chocolate chips on the counter is not chocolate chips. <laughs> <laughs> it's not trust me i ate one <laughs> there's nothing to write home about right that'll do it for this okay wait all right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so on that note, that'll do it for this week's episode of the CC Mouse Podcast. You can listen to us every Wednesday on your favorite music app. Interact with us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Check us out on our merch page at ccmousepodcast.shop. And we'll see you guys next week. Same mouse time, same mouse podcast. Bye. Bye. Hey, we did yeah. a really long thing for the second time in a row. It's like Groundhog's Day. Oh my gosh, right? Best Super Bowl commercial ever. Oh my gosh, you're still going on about that. <laughs> <laughs> I love how we just stop. Ah, done. All right. Yep. Take off my bra yep. now.